Coming up on episode 17 of the R Podcast, we continue our series on exploring Shiny and the community of Shiny developers. And I sit down with Vincent Nice, who's developed a very comprehensive Shiny application called Radiant. And we're going to talk all about how he got started using R and some of the motivations and development process for creating Radiant and his ideas for the future direction. So let's get going with this episode. I just have one question, of course. Are you ready? This is episode 17 of the R Podcast. I am your host, Eric Nance, and this is still continuing our track of exploring the Shiny, the shiny package for web application development, and in particular, the uh, community of Shiny developers that have done such excellent things. So before we get into our interview with Vincent, I'll just mention that I've received a lot of helpful feedback from, from many of you in terms of having some issues of uh, subscribing to the podcast using the newer versions of the feeds that I have on, on the um, our podcast site. So obviously this is uh, such a kind of nuisance to have to deal with. So I've actually spent some time and tried to figure out what was a good way to kind of guarantee that most uh, podcasting you know clients can actually get the episodes uh, delivered safely and, and reliably. So I did put a short post on the R podcast site. Um, uh, actually, I worked on this the night before I'm, I'm taping this part now. Um, and I have basically decided to also host the episodes of the podcast on a service called SoundCloud, which I've seen a few other podcasts start to use. In particular, um, one of the newer podcasts out there in the statistics, you know, area is um, the Not So Standard Deviations podcast with uh, Roger Pang and Hillary Parker, and they've been using that service. And of course, they're on iTunes now as well. Um, so I just figured, well, I could keep trying to plug away with this kind of custom solution I've had in terms of the site, and in particular. If I could somehow figure out how to do the RSS feeds reliably, but I figure, you know what, it's not worth it. And if I can just use this with SoundCloud, why not? Then another benefit will be that hopefully by the time you're hearing this, uh, this will also fix the whole iTunes uh, feed being missing so that you, many of our listeners are, of course, using iTunes so that you'll be able to subscribe on that as well. So. I didn't want to really belabor this too much, but I wanted to make sure that those of you that have tried to subscribe to the podcast since I relaunched it, that I've I've heard your feedback and I'm doing what I can to make sure that there's no you know hiccups to subscribing to the new episodes since I've there's a lot of exciting content coming our way. Um, so enough of enough of that uh, that tangent. Let's go ahead and dive into our main topic for today our interview with Vincent Nice. All right, welcome back, everybody. As I am recording this, it is day one, just wrapped up of the Shiny Developer Conference, and it has been a a very interesting day. Um, We've all learned a lot of great material, um, but I've now had the chance to sit down with one of the... uh, one of the leading members of the community in terms of really showing me pretty early on just the kind of power you can achieve with developing a shiny application that's a very kind of comprehensive analytical platform. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce my guest for today's episode, uh, Vincent Nigis. Nice. Nice. Yeah, Vincent right. Nice. Yeah, I knew I was going to screw that up. But welcome, <laughs> welcome to the R Podcast, Vincent. Thank you very much. Glad great. to be here. Great, great. Um, so why don't we just start off with uh, telling our listeners who may have not been familiar with your work, uh, a little bit about your background and uh, how you got started using R. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I work at the, the Rady School of Management, the business school. 
And um, I got my PhD in, in marketing, uh, marketing methods, marketing research. And so I kind of self-taught uh, and programming, just working with, with larger and larger data sets over time. Mm -hmm. And so I started out with, with Gauss and Ox and MATLAB um, and then tried Python for a while and eventually decided that R was probably going to be the most convenient platform for me to use. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been using that for a number of years and that's kind of my, my background, how I got into, into R. Cool. Now, that was an interesting, yeah, background to get into it. Um, did you have any background at all in kind of web development stuff beforehand or? Well, so I, uh, I have my own pet peeves about how I like things to work. <laughs> and so when I, when I started my, my first, first job as a professor at the, the uh, Kellogg's, uh, Kellogg School of Management, they had, um, I think it was Blackboard at the time. Oh, yes. I've and, heard of that. Or something like it. Sure. And I disliked that with a vengeance. And so. So, you know that's just really not convenient, and so I um, I started out with something in PHP, um, and looked at Ruby on Rails for a bit, and then eventually developed a site in uh, in Python and Django. Oh, okay. So always kind of server side. Never really did much client side, other than just some some, some minimal tweaking. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of what I what I started out with, and so in many ways I'm a I'm a I'm a, a poster user for for Shiny because mm -hmm. you can do a lot of stuff with minimal knowledge of HTML and, and JavaScript. Right, so right. That's, I think that's that's part of the things that really appealed. Mm -hmm. You can you can do a lot of stuff with without needing you know, deep knowledge about how JavaScript works and, and sure. how HTML necessarily is structured. So, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's funny you mentioned uh, the Python and, and the Django framework. Um, the our podcast site that I have up now is based on a Python package where it basically compiles the markdown I write for the site posts mm -hmm. and with a little configuration and stuff that renders the site in a static way so I don't have like a database behind or anything like that. Right, right, right. Um, ironically, I have to learn a bit about Python right now because apparently the way I do the RSS feeds for the podcast episode is not playing nice with some of the podcasting software. So, okay. so I'm, I, I have a new perspective on people that are new to like a software you know, package or a language and how it sometimes can be difficult to get up and running, but but anyway, that's a that's a tangent for another time. Um, so as we touch on Shiny, of course, and as I kind of mentioned in the intro, um, the way I got familiar with your work was the work you've done with uh, the Radiant application. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested, um, since I've been looking at it so closely, I'm interested in how you got started building the application and kind of what was the motivation around you know creating it. Sure, sure. So so I taught a, a class on, on research methods uh, for, for a long time to uh, MBA students at the business school. And um, we used SPSS for that. So oh, I, yeah. I was, there was multiple different faculty members were teaching that class. I mean, it was at the Kellogg Business School and it's a really big MBA program. Mm -hmm. So multiple te people teaching different sections of it. And, um, you know, it, it, it worked okay. Uh, but there was always certain things that were difficult to do. You know, we wanted to do something with multidimensional scaling and perceptual mapping. And then you'd have to run a factor analysis in SPSS and then take the output and then go to Excel and create a plot there. And then at some point we wrote a little macro to, to make that a little easier to do, but you know, it was never really a, a one-stop shop, if you will, right? So it had the, the algorithms in the background that you could estimate stuff with, but then the actual plots or things that you wanted to do with those to, to, to make you know, better, better business decisions, that's kind of what the, the class was focused on, not so much just the methods, but okay. how do you take the output and then make better decisions using that? Yeah, right? yeah. And so if you then have to go through three, four different steps to get from some output in a statistical package that you don't know to, you know, it just wasn't very convenient. Yeah. And so you spend a lot more time talking about, well, how do you do this than how do you use it, right? As mm -hmm. in for, for the, the decision-making part. Right. And so uh, I'd, like I said, I'd used that for a while. And then I, I uh, moved from Northwestern to the Rady School of Management in San Diego. Okay. I do CSD. Yep. And at some point I thought, you know what, it'd be nice to, to have something that's based on R. But our MBA students, very smart, but there's variance in terms of their level of experience with programming. Sure, sure. And so, you know, an MBA is a kind of a, a general purpose business education. So there's, there's some technical classes, but also lots of, less technical classes mm -hmm. and so you know you could teach them some programming in a, in a class or two but unless they're going to use that regularly i don't think they're going to get strong enough that they'll be able to use it on a day-to-day -day basis in their jobs i right? see 
And so I thought, you know what? There needs to be some type of front end for that. So I had a, had a TA at the time. And um, she kind of took a closer look at some of the, some of the packages that were out there. Um, and I honestly wasn't a big fan of most of them. Just mm. also in terms of the looks and stuff. I don't know even what the toolkits are that some of them are, are based on. But Okay. Uh, so the, the one that I started out with was called the Deducer. Yes, I'm familiar with that. Yeah, it's actually mm-hmm. very nice. But the there was a JavaScript, uh, sorry, not a JavaScript, a Java based uh, interface to that. Yes, and yes. that was actually what I had most trouble with across platforms. Ah, uh, and uh, so you know on Mac and on, and on Windows, and so as soon as I basically finished the quarter, I, I developed it for the first time. Mm-hmm. A colleague of mine said, "Hey, have you seen Shiny?" And I really should have seen that before. <laughs> Right, so it was it was brand brand spanking new at the time. Okay, but wow, this is fantastic! I just, okay. I just saw so many different opportunities in education based on that. Yes, um, and so yeah, I started developing it, and they started adding features that I wish had been there from the start. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's basically turned into a to a, a a large, reasonably large collection of different methods that are relevant for a business application. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there's other tools too, but if you look at you know, let's say a Stata. There's a, there's a ton of stuff in there, but none of it's geared towards business business applications. Right? So sure. if you look at the help files, you know, there's there's lots of stuff. If you're an epidemiologist or something like that, there's tools specifically for you. Yeah. But none of it's geared for business, and so that was my kind of focus. I, I wanted something that would be really to, relatively easy for them to use. Uh, that you know, the help files focus on business applications, so mm-hmm. it's easier for them to have a context to evaluate stuff in. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know you see the output that I think is important for their applications and and not fifty three other statistics that they're never going to use. Yeah. Okay. So and kind of I developed it from from there. So I, you know, for different classes and things. And, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So I mean it's it's a very comprehensive app. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm interested in as you were kind of starting to use this in your in your classes. Mm-hmm. What was the reception like from both your fellow colleagues in the department, but also among your students when they first started using it? Was there right, any right? Any resistance, uh, or is there you know a lot of optim- optimiz- optimism about it, or how did that work? I think uh, you know there's always there's always a, a, a student or two who her, um, would would like to use a commercial package, or okay. would prefer to do everything in Excel. Yeah, uh, but you know Excel's just not geared for kind of the the, the current world for for bigger data sets right. and and a variety of different computations. And so you can add you know do plugins and things like that to some extent, but it, it just doesn't get you there. So R has so much power in this in this space for doing so many different things, but it's kind of hard to harness it unless you're really good at programming. Sure. And so kind of pulling the stuff together that's relevant for them without the stuff that's not, I think they've really enjoyed that. Um, the interactivity I think is fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, you can they can they can change one thing and immediately see what that does to variance inflation factors or. Um, you know how, how that influences the residual plots, right? So they change one thing and they see all this different output coming out, right? Like, oh, okay, I get it, because uh, they can visualize things much easier. It's it's much quicker. Um, so yeah, overall, I think it's been very positive. My my colleagues have 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 embraced it, um, not in every department, but but I think <laughs> we're we're getting there. We're getting there. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, I mean, sometimes when you have new frameworks like this, it's not overnight that. Right. everybody's on board with it and, and things like that. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of parts that we could talk about in terms of what the app actually does mm-hmm. in terms of the features. I do want to hone on one thing because when I first saw it and I saw you implement this, I'm like, if, one, if there's one thing I'm going to take away from this, it's got to be this feature. Okay. That is the, the how you load and save the application state. Right. Because up until I, um, before I saw Radiant, I never seen anybody try this. Mm-hmm. But um, can you tell me a little bit about when you got the idea to do something like that and then kind of your development process for building a feature like that into a Shiny app? Right. Uh, yeah, so this was, as soon as I started on this and realized what I what I wanted to do, uh, which was not going to be just a couple of clicks and then you know you're done. Yeah. Uh, this was supposed to be something where students would come in, load data, um, you know, manage it, transform it, visualize it, and then do analysis, and then go back to some other parts and kind of they could they could be working on an assignment for for an hour or a couple hours, and then maybe have to come back to it later again. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, plus, of course, wanted it that if if they do an assignment 
then there should be some output that they can refer back to later. Right. right. And so as soon as I realized that, you know, if you hit, um, I don't know, some other, you know, you accidentally close the browser or you go someplace else, right? You click on that, then all of a sudden all your stuff is gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, my students are just going to go through the roof if that happens. Sure. So I started thinking about ways to to kind of fix that, and uh, I, I thought of something that was actually very simple, which is just um, as soon as as a shiny shiny session stops, um, you have an opportunity to do some stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of those is to save stuff like the input or um, uh, data or whatever it is. And um, I just decided to just save stuff to a list and store that. And then when you load it back up, there's basically only a small uh, function call instead of setting the value of, a, of an input, like a numeric input, say. Uh, you just call a function, and that function checks whether there's already a state value available. And okay. if it is, use that. Otherwise, set it to some initial value that you specify. And that seemed very simple to me. Um, so it, I initially thought that must not be the, the best way to do it. <laughs> but I talked to Joe about it at some point uh, from from our studio, and he said, "Oh, that's actually how I would do it too." Oh, like, oh, cool. wow, fantastic! That's an endorsement, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, he had some ideas to improve it, of course. So he <laughs> he was able to uh, help me out with with put, putting uh, like a session ID into the URL. Oh, and so with that, um, you can actually do some stuff that's nice on a on a server where you could take the URL with a session ID, give it to somebody else, and they would basically access the app with the exact same state that you've been working on. So it's not live, like how you can do, do chat and somebody would see immediately what you've changed, but mm -hmm. you know, I can store my state, send, send somebody that link, and they can see exactly where it was, mm -hmm. right? including the tab, the settings, everything. Um, and then, of course, just saving it to a, to a local file, and then when you want, want to revisit it or share it with somebody else who wants to be able to reproduce and see what you did, right. or an instructor who wants to grade their students' work, right? Yeah. I can see exactly <laughs> what they did and what they didn't do. Oh, right. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so... Um, it's been very convenient. Uh, I, I can't imagine not having that feature. Um, I honestly still like uh, somebody at our studio to kind of take that on and, and make it kind of a standard part of their their, their framework. So I'm sure you could still do it more efficiently. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that's, I, I can't imagine having a larger Shiny app where again, you could be on there for a longer time that you know, you wouldn't. You you just have to have some way to save state, and so we saw a really nice application of that today with uh, Shiny URL. Yes, I'm intrigued which, by which that. Which I think for for smaller smaller applications works very well because it just puts the inputs into the into the URL itself. Right, right. Which is great, um, and easy to share with somebody else so they can recreate recreate what you're doing. Yes. But if you have multiple data sets, transform data sets, lots of different inputs. I mean, overall, there's you know, hundreds of inputs, and you could have. You know, however many data sets your memory can hold inside a radiant and right. so I don't see how you could you can't share that yeah right? it doesn't state it doesn't scale as well as kind of the, the situation no but I think for um, it's kind of interesting to see the announcement around uh, modules which we're, which we're going to talk about at the conference tomorrow right right that they were all somewhat surprised about the the size of the apps that people were wanting to build and so if you're just doing a relatively small kind of relatively small application with you know a couple tabs and a couple inputs you know it's shiny url is probably the way you want to do it right. because it's very dynamic and it's it's probably very easy to set up but once you get to you know more data sets and more different analyses and people could actually be working for a longer time yeah i think i think probably something like what i do is uh, is, is probably very useful yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people are, are going to be emulating that if they haven't already. Um, right. Right. <laughs> myself included, actually. Um, so um, one one interesting part around this whole process is obviously you've put the code for a Radiant and even made a package out of it. And That's right. you've got it on GitHub so everybody yep. can see it. I'm curious when you release it on GitHub and up to this point, have there been any features or suggestions that the community has provided outside of your students that you've been able to kind of incorporate into the Radiant versions that you have now? Uh, there's been a, a, a few uh, requests, but mainly about how to, how to make it easier to extend. I see. Right, and so basically the, the, the app currently is, has four modules. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the, what I call the, the base module, which has um, you know, loading, visualizing, transforming, tabulating, combining, like merging data. And so that's actually a part that's called in all the other applications. Right? So it's not duplicated, it's actually just a component that you kind of pull in. And uh, you know, I know how to get it pulled into my other applications, but I'm, right. 
uh, you know, I need to talk to some some people at our studio about how I would ideally make that available as a module, as a package that somebody then could just say, hey, you know what, I'm just you know source whatever or library, yeah. you know, radian base or something, and then that's just part of your app, right? right? And you right. can call into it. Uh, and I've and I've thought about that off and on, um, but never got around to really giving it serious thought and serious work because sure. you know it's a it's a one one man show at the moment. Yeah, right. Uh, but so I'm actually hoping to, to talk to some folks from our studio tomorrow and see if they have any suggestions on how to do that. Yeah. Um, my my ideal uh, is so I actually made a, um, a an organization I guess uh, on GitHub. Oh, cool. Uh, which has me only as the member at the moment. Oh, well, but again, the idea there was if I can break up uh, Radiant into modules where one of them would be the, the kind of the base, uh, the, the base um, component. Mm -hmm. And then somebody who's working in, you know, uh, bio, biotech or, uh, you know, just pure statistics or whatever area it might be, can take parts of that and then make their own adaptation of, let's say, some other module. Like I have a, uh, it's for a class I teach uh, on quantitative analysis, which has a lot of statistics in it. But you could take some of that, adapt it, but then what I'd like it to be, of course, is that there's like a repository where people make their own adaptations and host them in the same spot right. so that we can all learn from each other. Yeah, that's right. Key, about right? different ways to do different things. And then um, rather than somebody just forking it and then developing their own and then making it hard to kind of yeah. take the learnings from different people back into the kind of the base. Right. So, so that's my longer term vision for it. I hope mm -hmm. that other people, I mean, I'm sure that in, in statistics, like a Statistics 101 or, or even more advanced topics, you could use this as a way to get students excited mm -hmm. and then say, okay, and now let's dig into the code or, or the algorithms of how this is actually done. Right? So it's more of a kind of a top down rather than necessarily a bottom up approach, which I think works well with a lot of students. If they, if they just start with the math and then you have to tell them, well, just trust me for now, you know, in 30 weeks or 30, you know, three quarters, then you'll understand why you need all this. Right? <laughs> you know, for some people that works fantastic, for sure. others it doesn't. So yeah, yeah. my, I'm, on, I'm more on the, let's let's sell the thing first and then I can show you how it really works and what things yeah. you have to take into account. So right, right. anyway, that's long story short. I'm hoping that that's ultimately going to be what will happen is that I can break it up into modules and that people can take parts of those and, and add new modules and we can all learn from each other and kind of make a better application for doing statistical analysis and machine learning in our Right, right. Well, I think that's um, as more people, you know, you get their hands on it. I think I think that's a goal that's going to be achieved. Right. Question is when and also how right. that's implemented. But right. yeah, I'm definitely interested in, in learning more tomorrow about how modules can help us with a lot of these right. uh, yes. um, goals. <laughs> so I'm actually a bit worried about that one because if it if yeah. it really is as good a, good an idea as it sounds, that might actually be a great way to structure larger apps. Right. Um, again, I'm I'm curious how it how it would work with packages. I mean, I think Shiny hasn't really been set up to to work as a package mm, yeah uh, i mean it's, it's supposed to be an, an an app that you run with with run app sure as opposed to an actual package itself sure right right uh, right so finding ways to kind of distribute that and and kind of incorporate it where again you just do something like source or whatever and it, it's just now it's part of your app too yeah that would be fantastic because right? yeah. then people don't have to reinvent the wheel they can kind of focus on adding those components that are important mm -hmm. for their line of work or their company or whatever it may be yeah. So, uh, but if again, if modules is is as good as it, it sounds like, then I'll I'll probably be faced with a lot of extra work to kind of recode <laughs> and stuff. So, yeah. we'll see how that goes. Actually, yeah. you know, we're starting a, a master of science in business analytics at at my school in in fall. And one thing I hope is that uh, I'll have time to clean up the app enough that when we teach our students about how to use Shiny for for business applications and business support tools. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to take some of this and look at it and say, you know what, that's that's a good model for them to work off of. Right, so right. That's the plan anyway. Well, well, I know I'll be a curious observer. I'm sure many others as well. Mm -hmm. um, Ian mentioned, you know, interacting with uh, with Joe Chang on some various yes. um, parts of the development process. I thought it was really interesting that I can't remember how when this happened, but Radian has actually now been featured on the uh, gallery user mm -hmm. showcase of Shiny Apps. So. Um, can you tell me a little bit how some of those interactions came about with uh, the RStudio team and how that's been helpful and kind right. of your learning right. of Shiny and, of course, the development of Radiant? You know? Right. Yeah, no, so, I mean, um, I, when I think Shiny was still in alpha, I was, I was using it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had lots of questions, lots and lots of questions. Because, I mean, the, the reactivity model, as I'm sure anybody who starts out with, with, uh, 
with Shiny or just reactive programming in general, it's it's a little different, right? Yes. It takes a little while to wrap your head around. I mean, I, yes. what do you mean I can't call something with parameters? Right? How does that work exactly? So it's still something that you know is, is difficult to, to wrap your head around at times. But um, Joe and 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 Winston and uh, Yuhui has been you know incredibly helpful, um, you know, around the the saving and loading state. You know, I had some questions about different ways to do that, and you know, great, fantastic suggestions about how to improve stuff. Um, so the, uh, the our studio actually kind of gives me a, a, a discounted rate or whatever. The, the, another thing, it's a free account, but with more resources on more it. More resources, to I kind see. of yeah, host yeah. host gradient on uh, Shiny Apps IO. Cool. Uh, kind of as because it's a. I mean, they're interested, of course, in showcasing their work as well. And sure. So the mutually beneficial then. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so I have I still have lots of ideas for things that they could that they could do. So I'm hoping to corner some more people tomorrow and see yeah. <laughs> you know, things they could work on. But right. just the tools that they've developed, like you know, DT that um, uh, Yui has worked on, yes. it's just a fantastic, fantastic way to kind of tabulate data. And I've used that in, you know, in numerous different spots mm -hmm. to create uh, you know, pivot tables and, and, and summary tables and stuff like that. And that just to visualize data uh, works fantastically well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the drag and drop uh, feature with um, Selectize. Oh, right. Which was not initially a, a part of Shiny. Um, you know, I was talking to you, you about that in an email. I was like, oh, yeah, that, that should definitely be in Shiny. And like next day, he's got that implemented in there. It's like, fantastic. <laughs> right. So that I don't have to pull in, you know, JavaScript libraries from somewhere. Right, um, right. They're just fantastic guys. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that they're, that they're there. Um, and some of the stuff that they presented today, like um, uh, Shiny gadgets that, that Hadley presented. They're just coming out with fantastic new stuff. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's um, the whole pipeline of data analysis. Their tools are just making it so much easier. Than, yep. uh, I've been using R for what was it, 11, 12 years now, and mm -hmm. man, we had the I had to cook a lot of things kind of together in my head and cobble things together. But if yep. someone that's starting R now, I mean, the ecosystem is so much friendlier, and obviously they're at probably the forefront of making these tools available for us. Absolutely. To, to of course, you know, the, the whole Hadleyverse, yes. you know, the D pliers, the GG plots, tidy um, you know, you name it. Um, they've just made a fantastic, uh, have had a fantastic impact on kind of the usefulness and, and the power of R. And yes. I think that they're, they're very, very influential in terms of how much uh, more rapidly R is being adopted in, in, in firms and companies. Right. Right. So, right. That's that's to their advantage. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, obviously great things are ahead of them, and as we've seen in, in the conference so far today, there, there's so much engagement on what they're doing, and they're they're definitely getting feedback as well from us and how we're using it in day to day usage. That's and right. it sounds like they got some ideas for improvements that you know hopefully down the road we'll all be able to benefit from. Um, um, so I, w I would say from your perspective, obviously we talk about how useful the tools from our studio are to a new user of R. Um, if you, if someone was coming to you that wanted to learn R, what kind of advice would you give them if, you know, to get them up to speed quicker? Right, right. Um, so I actually put a little, um, so in the documentation site that's on, for Radiant that's on GitHub, yeah. um, I, I just put some links together with different things to, for them to, to look at. Okay. And so I, I, I mean, that sounds a bit a bit bad, but I, I wouldn't actually start with just base R. I would go straight to ggplot and dplyr, right? And so those I'm, would probably I'm hearing be... that more and more, actually. So I'm not sure how bad that sounds because I think, you know, some things in base R are so cryptic that it's hard to really wrap your head around how they work, you know? I know some people have different opinions on yeah, that. But... I mean, so I, I, like I said, you're absolutely right. So people have different opinions about how you could approach things. And obviously, we're all, we all owe a, a, a big debt of gratitude to the people who developed R. Yes. Right. Um, but that said, there's so many different ways in which you could do things. And given the power that's available through dplyr to kind of manipulate and, and reorganize your data, um, you know, if somebody's new to R, that would be the first thing I would tell them is just right. go learn dplyr. Right. And then and then look at look at ggplot um, and shiny, to be honest. Yeah, sure. Right. I mm -hmm. mean, those those would be hands down the, the three that I would start with. Mm -hmm. So because um, if you can wrap your head around that, you can kind of learn the other parts of our syntax and of sure. course Magritte. Uh, so I mean that's that's <laughs> right. part of it yeah but um, I, I can't even imagine how to write code without without pipes anymore yeah uh, in fact I probably overdo it here and there but well. it's just it's just such a nice way and you don't have to think 
this may sound really simple, but just thinking about variable names and how to how to call stuff in a logical way. Yes. And yes. how and how you're able to avoid so much of that just by using pipes. Right. Um, it's just fantastic. Yeah, I think the readability it gives you that not only for others maybe reviewing your code, mm -hmm. but you yourself, like two years later, if you have to go back to it. Yes. I think the pipe is more translatable than like a whole bunch of nested parentheses or a bunch of temp variables that you have like temp one, temp two or whatever. It, That's right. This avoids all of that. And yeah. ironically, there's even more than one package that does pipes. I mean, Magritte, of course, is the biggest yeah, one, true. but there's the piper package that true. does his own take on it. So there's even choice on that side of it too. So true. lots of lots of opportunities for people to use all that right. framework. Right. Um, yeah, so this this has been really fascinating to kind of get to know your your mindset on approaching these things. Mm -hmm. um, for our, for our listeners that are interested in you know keeping up with kind of work you're doing, what are the best ways to kind of keep tabs on what you're up to? Um, check out the the GitHub site. Okay. Uh, so there's also the uh, gh uh, gh pages. Um, what do you call that? Well, the GH pages part yeah, of the, the, of the repo, of it, right? Right. Yeah. So that's where I, I try to keep the documentation as up to date as possible. Okay. But uh, yeah, no. So I'm actually teaching a new class this quarter on customer analytics, and so I'm, I'm expanding, uh, you know, adding a bunch of tools, neural networks, uh, decision trees, mm -hmm. um, right? So different different tools that we're going to need in, in that in that particular space, and so you know, it's still expanding quite quite rapidly. Cool. So um, yeah, and then so like I said, next year we're starting or this fall we're starting on the on the new MSBA program. So mm -hmm. you know, going to be a lot of uh, adaptations for that as well. Sure, sure. So, well, definitely. So a lot more to to keep working on. <laughs> yeah, it never ends sometimes, but it sounds no, it like seems a, that way. Yeah, but big things are in store, and we're hopefully going to take a lot of the lessons we're learning today and put them in practice yep, for exactly our future development. Well, you know, part of you know me being here this weekend, one of my motivations is like getting to know the community of people around this, and you know, and talking with you, I feel like yeah, I'm really excited to see where you're going with this and. Mm -hmm. You've already given me some good advice from my personal app that I'm working on. I'm going to take you up on some of the concepts Absolutely. we talked about sure. and hopefully share some code back and forth to improve our our uh, apps down the road. But um, definitely, uh, Vincent, thank you so much for joining me today. And um, definitely, I'll be seeing you again tomorrow, obviously. But yep. uh, best of luck with the continued development of Radiant and your the rest, of your, uh, rest of your career going forward. So Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, we'll be back right after this. All right, so that was a, a really entertaining chat, and um, I've actually was talking with Vincent quite a bit during the during the conference. Um, he and I definitely have a lot in common in terms of our, our, of course, we're passionate about R and where we want to take our our respective applications with Shiny in terms of what we're what we're up to. We <laughs> definitely had an interesting day that day. Um, yeah, he was to make a make a funny story out of this. We were going to um, basically a, a dinner that the that we had arranged for us for all the attendees, and we had a good time chatting with everybody there. And then the bus took us back to um, the university where um, the conference was held, and I had rented a car down here just to help get around a little easier in case the weather was a little rough. And then when the bus dropped us off, we were trying to figure out since it was kind of dark out where where we were in terms of where I parked and we kind of went almost across campus where we figured out wait we better better go the other way and I used my jeep my uh, phone on google maps to reorient myself and it just um, he was very nice to put up with my uh, lack of direction <laughs> so we, we had a good time to chat about all sorts of stuff during this so um, I just want to thank Vincent for taking the time to talk with me and by the time we actually did the interview, it had been, a, you know, obviously a very um, productive day, but a long day. So we were, we were just happy that once we wrapped up that we just got some rest after that. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was a very entertaining conversation. And I'm going to be uh, keeping in touch with Vincent as I work on some of my um, apps um, that I've been taking some of the ideas that he's had with Radiant and trying to kind of do some custom things on my side for my particular needs but 
I think he and I have a good chance to collaborate together on some some other ideas in the future. So um, I'm not going to I don't have a lot of feedback to get to in terms of um, listener feedback for this episode. And um, I think I'll just kind of put a put a bow on, on this one. And um, I'll definitely mention that the episodes coming up, I think, uh, are going to be really enjoyable. I'm, I'm really excited to get that uh, content out to you guys and just um, interacting with the other developers at the shiny uh, developer conference it's been so cool to put faces with the names of people that you've either used their apps or their packages for and it's just been really cool to have that that camaraderie and the the energy that we've had during the conference has just been it's just been infectious and i i wish i could experience this like more than just once a year and whoever i mean they're obviously going to do it again next year i think but it's just so cool to finally be at an r conference and be around uh, uh, other r programmers that or developers that like it as much as i do so anyway um i'm gonna wrap up of episode 17 and definitely thanks a lot for everybody to that listened in and continue to send the feedback as always um through the multiple um ch- uh, channels we have such as the uh, contact page on www.r-podcast.org slash contact um you can also comment on this episode's uh, post directly via the discuss commenting system and also um you can just send me a straight email at the rcast at gmail.com So again, thanks a lot, everybody, and until next time. End of line.